Again, it is a privilege to be up before you and appreciate all the outstanding messages. Every one of them have just been powerful and excellent. Uh, Friday night, yesterday, and this morning, and Brother Paul this afternoon a while ago, we appreciate all of them. And I am I'm glad that uh, Brother Michael mentioned that about the books a while ago before the last lecture because I was going to buy a few more. But then I was relieved to find out I could get some from Brother Bruce Stalting back there. So after the lecture, I went up to him to uh, talk to him about it. He wanted to know how many I wanted. I said four. He said, that'll be $40. <laughs> he said, that's for shipping and handling. They had to go back there and pick them up and bring them up here. And then he's, I gave him $20, he said, that's a good down payment. So, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, do appreciate the good books also back there. I also uh, like to thank again the Lord's Church at Bellevue, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, and the eldership here for this great work and for this lectureship and the leadership for the opportunity to be here. Brother Paul mentioned a while ago about uh, the youth directors and trying to do what people like and everything. I remember one time there was a, a youth director in a large congregation and he had carried off the young people to hear Jeff Walling, who's a false teacher, as you know, for many, many years. And uh, he made the comment, well, he'd rather take them off to hear somebody like that than to hear some boring preacher. That's the way some people look at plain Bible preaching, isn't it? Book, chapter, and verse preaching. Well, that's just boring preaching. Well, I'd also like to ask you to, uh, again, I'm thankful to have my beloved wife and son here with me. Please pray for us as we travel back. Lord willing, our daughter will be with us next time. You, Lord willing, we get to come. And please pray for us as we go to England next month for the work of the Lord. And also with Brother Johnny and his group in the fall, he asked me to go on the lectureship there in October. But uh, one reason that I mention that is to pray for us, number one. But I think about going over to England, there are two gospel preachers that really had a lot to do with that work. Of course, Brother Graham Moulton passed away several years ago. Brother Keith Sisman, whose one-year death anniversary date will be coming up in August, and Brother Ken Chumley, who came to this lectureship so often, was going over twice a year. And I know the brethren there really miss both of them, and rightly so. And I, I miss them personally as faithful brethren in Christ. But I also think about, I'd like to start out this evening with a scripture from Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 9. Because you know what kind of preachers we got here at this lectureship? We got a bunch of hard-headed preachers. And I'm saying that in context of Ezekiel 3, 9. Ezekiel, as an adamant, harder then flint have I made thy forehead, fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Now that sense of having a head like an adamant stone, or a head adamant harder than flint, an adamant stone, is a compliment to God's people. There's one sense that our head ought to be like, that we ought to be like an adamant stone. And have you ever had anybody to tell you you were hard-headed and stubborn because you wouldn't compromise the truth? Or at least to imply that? I had a preacher one time introduce me at a preacher's meeting as being independent-minded. I, I think I know what he meant, though. You know, friends, we have to be hard-headed in a way and convicted and refused to compromise like the apostles who said we ought to obey God rather than men. 
But now for the lesson text in Zechariah 7, 12, we want to look at those with a heart as an adamant stone. And this, of course, is in a bad way. It's one thing to be hard as adamant or adamant stone when it comes to standing for the truth and refusing to compromise, and I'm thankful that you brethren here are like that. But on the other hand, to be adamant toward God's will is another matter. That's rebellion. As we turn to the book of Zechariah, the seventh chapter, and verse number 12. This was not long after the people of Judah had gone through the 70-year exile, the Babylonian captivity, which of course occurred after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple around 586-87 B.C. And now this is 70 years later, a little bit after that, and the rebuilding of the temple had begun. And now Zechariah is drawing lessons from what had happened to the people of Judah and warning God's people again. In Zechariah chapter 7 and verse number 12, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. The American Standard says, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which Jehovah of hosts has sent by his Spirit. Now, I like that version of this because Spirit is capitalized. God sent the Holy Spirit through the prophets. And certainly this is in accord with what Peter said regarding the prophets of old. That holy men of God spake as they were born along or guided or moved by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. He said, had sent by his spirit by the former prophets, therefore there came great wrath from Jehovah of hosts. Now Matthew Henry makes this comment about the expression adamant stone. They made their hearts as an adamant stone, as a diamond, the hardest of stones to be wrought upon, or as a flint which the mason cannot hew into shape, as he can other stone out of the quarry. Now this is a good comment he makes here. Nothing is so hard, so unmalleable, so inflexible as the heart of a presumptuous sinner. And those whose hearts are hard may thank themselves they are of their own hardening, and it is just with God to give them over to a reprobate sense, to the hardness and impenitence of their own hearts. An adamant stone, the hardest of stones. The prophet here uses lessons of the past to impress upon them what happened to those who were stubborn, rebellious, hard-hearted, and disobedient. We have an example of this in Jeremiah the 6th chapter, verse 16. He was one of those former prophets that was referred to. When he said to the people of Judah before they went into captivity, trying to get them to come back to the good and right way, so that first of all, their souls wouldn't be lost, but secondly, so that they would not have to go into Babylonian captivity. He said, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Now, this scripture, although given way back in the days of Jeremiah, is relevant even in today. The Lord is calling us unto the good and the right way, the straight and narrow way of the Lord, which will provide rest for our souls, yea, salvation. But there are many people like the people of Judah who say, we will not walk therein. We can well understand why he said that their heart was like unto an adamant stone. But as we think about the method here of this inspired prophet of God, Zechariah, it is unlike unto many other speakers and writers in the Bible. Even the Lord himself called the people to remember lessons from the past. He said, remember Lot's wife, Luke 17, verse 32. 
Jude said in Jude verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, destroyed them, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And then we recall Peter using Sodom and Gomorrah as an example, and the angels that sinned there in 2 Peter chapter 2, warning the people. And Paul and the many warnings that he gave regarding the children of Israel in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 13. In that context, he said, let, no, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall like those children of Israel. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Now back when I was preaching at Beach Hill near Mount Pleasant back in the 80s, one Lord's Day morning I was sitting on the front pew and one of the brethren was up giving the scripture reading. And all of a sudden, I, sudden I heard people in the audience gasping and, and oh, you know, and all this. And, and this brother, and this really happened, he was reading 1 Corinthians 10. About the time he got to the part about the serpents, people started uh, gasping for breath. A snake jumped into the baptistry. <laughs> that, that may seem hard to believe, but it really did happen. And... Uh, a couple of brethren got up and handled that snake. <laughs> Not mar they took it out. They didn't. We weren't, we weren't teaching the handling of serpents. But nevertheless, we are to be warned of lessons from the past. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the captivity could have been avoided had the people listened. And that's one of the things Zechariah is saying here. In Zechariah chapter 7 and verse number 7, Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south and the plain? Perhaps the people of Judah mistook their prosperity for favor with God. And people do that today in our society, don't they? And in the Lord's church. And in these congregations where many people are prosperous and doing well, they take that as a sign of God's favor and grace. Well, we can lose all that just real quickly. And the people of Judah did lose it. They didn't listen to Jehovah God, and they paid the price. And one of the great things about the book of Zechariah, there are many things, but are the messianic prophecies in here? And I'm not going to go into all of them at this time. But for example, in Zechariah, the 12th chapter, we have the prophecy of the crucifixion there in the latter part of the verse. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and, as they, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness of him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. You remember when the Christ was on the cross, John referenced this prophecy, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. John chapter 19, verse 37. They shall look upon me or whom they have pierced, according to this scripture. And in John chapter 19, this was a fulfillment of prophecy. And also, in the sixth chapter of the book, of Zechariah, there is another great prophecy regarding Christ and his kingdom. In addition to this one, they shall look on him whom they pierce. Here's a promise of the building of the Lord's church. In Zechariah 6 and verse 12, Christ is called the branch with a capital B. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is called the house of the Lord. And at the end of Ephesians chapter 2, where uh, Brother Brewer we studied this morning about the church, and that excellent lesson, the church is referred to as a temple, isn't it? It's the Lord's house. So here is a prophecy of the building of the temple of the Lord, the church. Even he, verse 13, shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. This has to refer to Jesus Christ, not the Levitical priesthood, because there was no priest in Israel who was the king. 
The priests were of the Aaronic order. Jesus Christ was after the order of Melchizedek. He is our great high priest. Jesus is the Son of God, Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. And he is also King of kings, Lord of lords, and blessed and only potentate. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. But what I'm getting to here is that the attitude in Zechariah 7, 12, with a heart as hard as an adamant stone, was not, on, was not only the attitude that led Judah into captivity that caused it, but it would be that same heart and attitude that later would cause Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, to be rejected also on the part of the Jews. That very same attitude. And Jesus warned them, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, verse number 48. Now their question to the prophet was this, Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these so many years? Should we continue these fasts as we did during the 70 years of captivity? Then came the word of the Lord, beginning at verse 4, of host unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land, and to the priest, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? You didn't do it for me anyway. You did it for yourselves. It was self-centered religion. Even during the captivity, even after they had suffered all this heartache and being uprooted and carried over into Babylon, many of them had not learned the lesson yet. They did not truly do it for Jehovah God. They did it for themselves. Now the answer of the Lord through the prophet Zechariah to them is basically this. You need to hear the word of God. That's what you need to do. Verse number 7, Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain? So your real need is to hear and obey the word of God. That is your basic need. Now their religion reminds us of many of the Jews when Jesus walked the earth. In Matthew 15, verse 7, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Do we see today, friends, what leads to following the commandments of men? It's self-centeredness, being selfish, not having our hearts on God. But we want to do what we want to do. As those Peter described in 2 Peter chapter 2, being presumptuous and self-willed and despising government and authority. Jude, of course, which is very similar to 2 Peter chapter 2, also says in verse number 8, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, Despise dominion, that is, they don't like authority. Is that a problem in the church today? People don't want authority. They do not want to respect the authority of elders. Many do not want to respect their parents, honoring father and mother. Some do not want to respect their husbands as the leader of the home. Many in our society do not respect civil authority anymore, as we well know. And most importantly, many do not respect God and His Word. They do not fear God and keep His commandments, which the wise man said is the whole duty of man, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. They do not have the fear and reverence for God in them. That is the underlying problem today, beloved friends, in the church of our Lord. People do not respect God and His Son, Jesus Christ. They do not respect the authority of the Scriptures. If they did, they would not be going into the four winds with all these divers and strange doctrines that are coming about, and following the doctrines of men. We need to learn the lessons 
of the past. We go back to another one of these former prophets that he refers to, and this is Isaiah in chapter 1. In Isaiah, the first chapter, beginning at verse number 16. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But now let's look more closely at the text here in verses 8 to 10. One of the problems was they did not have love and compassion for their fellow man. And I appreciated the lesson we heard a while ago on love. But a lot of people truly do not understand what true love is. We have some that are proclaiming love, but they don't know how to treat their fellow man properly. We remember what Micah said in Micah 6, 8. He has showed the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to love mercy and to do justly and to walk humbly with thy God. Yes, as members of the church, and even when we preach sound doctrine, we must be reminded that our, fellow, our relationship to our fellow man is very important in how we treat our fellow man. That we truly do unto others. As Jesus said, All therefore whatsoever you would the men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law of the prophets. Matthew 7 and verse 12. We are to treat our fellow man fairly and justly and with mercy and love and kind and goodness. Kindness. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 verse 32. And I'm sure we have all seen brethren who knew the Bible and could really speak it out, but they didn't know how to treat their fellow man right. And we've talked a lot about strong, sound doctrine, and that's very important, of the utmost importance. We can't have God in Christ without abiding in His doctrine, Second John 9. But in order to truly abide in the doctrine of Christ, we must treat our fellow man as the Lord teaches us to treat them. And we can profess to be godly people, but if we do not deal properly, and even with those in need, such as the fatherless and the widow, one of the things we're talking about here is being hard-hearted. Some of the hardest hard-heartedness, however you won't get tongue-tongled here in a minute, that you can see among those professed to be members of the church is regarding orphans. James teaches us that all through the Old Testament, we have ad, the people had admonitions to care for the fatherless and the widows. God does. God cares for them. He's always had a place in his heart for the fatherless and the widows. And there are those today claiming to be members of the church that would fight you tooth and nail that the Lord's church cannot help a little helpless orphan child or a destitute widow. James 1, 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To visit them doesn't mean you go to their door and say, you know, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. i got to go on now. No, to visit means to see to their needs and seek to supply those needs. That's what God's Word teaches. But anyway, let's go on to verses 11 and 12. Really getting down to the core here of what we're talking about. In verse 11, But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Verse 11. Imagine this, friends. They gave a cold shoulder to the Lord is what they did. Has anyone ever given you a cold shoulder? I'm sure we've been through that before. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 29, we read of those, they gave a backsliding shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. Are there not people today giving a cold shoulder to the Lord? Turning away their shoulder from Him? I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear this. They may not say it to the Lord, but that's who it is toward. When we present God's Word, 
and they turn away their shoulder and bow their necks and are obstinate. And as Brother Kibbe used to say, stiff-necked. When they're stiff-necked and won't hear and won't obey God's word, they're giving a cold shoulder unto the Lord. The Lord had a great purpose in punishing his people in the Old Testament and allowing them to suffer. It's because he loved them. And the Hebrews writer said, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. But sadly, there are many people who do not appreciate the chastening and correction of the Lord. And all the things that they go through are but in vain because it does not improve them or make them any better or cause them to humble themselves in the sight of the Lord that they might be lifted up. What a sad thing that is. Evidently, there were many who still had not learned the lesson of the 70 years exile. God had sent his spirit by the former prophets, such as Elijah, Elisha, Hosea, Jonah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Amos, Micah, and others. But they refused to hear. We notice here in verse number 12, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit, that is, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. You know who this reminds us of? It reminds us of Acts chapter 7 in the gospel preacher Stephen. History is repeating itself all over again. What did Stephen say about these people before they stoned him? In Acts chapter 7 and verse number 51. We read uh, what he said to them. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, Stephen was a strong preacher, wasn't he? Can you imagine anybody saying anything stronger to a Jew than this, that he was uncircumcised? That was a powerful punch right there, wasn't it? But it wasn't a punch just to get them back, but to reach into their hearts and try to provoke them to repentance. He's laying out their condition as it really is. He says, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, just like your father's. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. How is the Holy Spirit of God grieved? It is the way that we're talking about here. To resist the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. The fact of the matter is, friends, that God is grieved when people have such a heart as these people have had and as many have today. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 10, speaking of the children of Israel, the Lord God said, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. They resisted God in their hearts. Oh yes, people may put on a good show and pretend that they're obedient to the Lord and that they're faithful. But if our heart is not right with God, there's no way that we can be right with God at all. Now one of the great lessons here in Zechariah chapter 7 is that we do have control over the kind of heart that we have. We have control. Notice what Zechariah said. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. They did it themselves. They caused their hearts to be like this. If it is not the case that we cannot control the kind of heart that we have, why does the scripture teach us and command us to have the right kind of heart? Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, verse number 8. The wise man said, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it is the issues of life. Proverbs 23 and verse number 7. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Philippians 2 verse 5 certainly relates to man's heart. Where the apostle said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
Yes, we determine the kind of heart that we have. When we get up in the morning, we make the decision as to whether we're going to enter into the new day with prayer or not. If we're going to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. We make the decision as to whether, as Brother Johnny taught so well this morning, we search the scriptures daily or not, Acts 17, verse 11. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, Colossians 3, verse 16. We make the decision if we're going to think on those things that Paul gave in Philippians 4, 8, things that are lovely, pure, good, of good report, honest. We make that decision, friends. And having the right kind of heart is a daily decision that we make. It's the things that we do throughout the day, the things that we think upon. Of the godly man, the psalmist said, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. But now consider the consequences that came upon these people when they made their hearts as hard as an adamant stone. Great wrath came upon them from the Lord of hosts. They faced the wrath of God. After their refusal to hear the many tender pleadings of the Lord to them through the prophets, their hearts became harder and harder and harder. As a result, the Lord's blessings and protection were lost to them. They went into Babylonian captivity. And one of the great things that they suffered was the Lord refused to hear their cry. Verse 13, Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, that is the Lord cried to them through the prophets, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, said the Lord of hosts. Now a lot of people want the Lord to hear them when they have trouble. They get on their backs, they start looking up. But when they get on their feet again, they don't want to get on their knees and serve the Lord faithfully. Because they wouldn't hear the Lord, he wouldn't hear them. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5, 16. Who is he that is righteous? He that doeth righteousness. He is righteous. He that doeth righteousness as he that is the Lord is righteous. 1 John 3, verse 7. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. But another consequence was that they were scattered. And they lost that land of promise. There are some people who are still looking for the land promises of Israel to be restored. No, friends. Those promises have been fulfilled and then lost because of the disobedience of God's people under the old covenant. Moses warned of this in Deuteronomy 4, verse 27 and 28, verse 64, and numerous other places in the Old Testament. That yes, God is giving you this land, but keeping this land is conditional upon your faithfulness and obedience to Jehovah God. And of course, they were not faithful. They laid the pleasant land desolate. That is what Ezekiel would call the glory of all lands. Ezekiel 20, verse 6 and verse 15. Today, we need to understand that God's blessings are conditional. As we close here brief, briefly, there are great lessons that we can learn. One is that if our religion is self-centered and not God-centered and from the heart, then we are far from God. Religious rituals will not make us acceptable to God. If our heart is far from God, our worship is in vain. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Surely this involves when we are worshiping. It must be in truth according to God's word. I've heard brethren say it doesn't really mean that, but it does mean that. We worship according to God's word, the truth. But also it must be in spirit, from the inside, from the heart. And certainly if our worship is genuine from the heart, the life is going to go with it before we come to worship. It's been said that some people will 
sow their wild oats on Saturday night and then on Sunday pray for a crop failure. But the fact of the matter is, friends, that we are going to reap as we have sown Galatians 6 and verse 7. Another great lesson is that the Lord is grieved when people are hard of heart. Go back there to Mark chapter 3 and verse number 5. Before the Lord healed the man with the withered hand. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Let's be sure that we as Christians never become cold and hard-hearted. That we be a tender-hearted people. A people of love and compassion and love and respect for the Lord. In the doing of his will. The Lord is grieved with the hardness of heart. And those who became hardened against God's will will face great wrath from the Lord. And that will be true at the end of time. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 beginning of verse 7. And to you her trouble rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. We don't have to be out here committing crimes or immoral acts to know not God. All we have to do is not obey God. James said to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. James 4, 17. The only way that we can know God according to the scripture is to do his commandments. John said, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2 verse 3. That's the only way we can know the Lord. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Indeed, friends, we do not want to face the wrath of God, either because we have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, or because we have obeyed it and become like the people of God of old and have a heart as an adamant stone, hard heart, rebellious, stubborn, and disobedient. Let us remember Hebrews 10, verses 30 and 31. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If we should have any here in this hour whose name is not written in the book of life, remember that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire as John pictures the judgment and that day when the Lord will make a separation according to Revelation 20 and verse 15. Is your name my friend in the Lamb's book of life? You've heard the gospel. Do you believe the gospel? Romans 10, 17. Believing, are you willing to repent, to have that change of mind, resulting in a change of life? Unless we do, we shall perish. Luke 13, verse 3 and 5. Are we willing to make the good confession? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. And then, like the Ethiopian nobleman, go down into the water. Go down in sin, but come up in Christ. Are you ready to do that? And now, why tearest thou, rise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Acts 22, 16. Being washed in the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1, 19. Have you done that, my friend, but have you left your first love? And you need to repent and do the first works. And repent and pray God's forgiveness that you might be restored to the Lord again, according to Acts 8, 22. If this be your need today, would you not come while together we stand and we sing? <laughs>